Hey, everybody. Welcome to this week's episode of Consolidus Place. No matter what your genre, what your specialty, what your ambition, watch this episode with American genius Dave Cobb. More on him in just a second. But first, a shout out to our friends who are nominated for Grammys. We're going to give those to you week after week. For instance, Mixed by Ali for Rockstar, Louis Bell, Manny Matakin for Post Malone Circles, Phineas and Rob Kanelsky for Billie Eilish, Josh Goodwin for Dua Lipa, Don't Start Now, Spike Stent, and Emily Lazar for Coldplay Everyday Life. Congratulations to all you guys and more to come next week. Uh, hit us on all our socials. You know what they are. You see them right here. Like, subscribe, and click notify. And now, without further ado, one of our all-time favorites, one of the baddest boys ever, literally an American genius. Enjoy our conversation with Dave Cobb. What's up, bro? Hey. Man, you know, just surviving the end of the world. How about you guys? Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> you just came out of Snowcopolis in, in Nashville, just internet down no service isolated and and but but we're still standing yeah yeah it's like living in the olden days as my 11 year old says uh, i got enough of it man i'm ready to ditch that that uh horse and carriage man and get back on the internet talk yeah to yeah it, it well, feels like the times we're living in are like musical chairs when the vaccine stops it everybody everybody just finds a chair and somebody's gonna get it it's like <laughs> and then you just <laughs> remove that chair <laughs> That's funny. Uh, I just got mine and I was ready to be kind of footballish about it in case there was a problem. But fortunately, it was a very smooth. You you are glowing, though. Well, you know what? I I noticed (laughs) that I had a third thumb down here, but I I shaved it for for the interview. We'll see what happens. I did the same thing, too. I'm hiding mine. Here's what's ironic in talking about the pandemic. Last time I saw Dave was at a live event. At the forum, it was the Chris Stapleton tour. He was playing guitar. We ran into each other at the forum club, and and now we've come full circle. Now the irony, and Dave, you're a, a recipient of it. Dave Cobb is is in certain sectors during the pandemic. There's been incredible growth on the music side. You know, the home recording stuff has gone through the roof. Retailers are making a lot of stuff. Music has a certain resiliency. And a certain need right now, if you're at home, you know, we collaborate with files and we connect and you can work on things and so on and so forth. So in a weird way, I'm hearing more about music helping people get through this, almost being a way of therapy, but also a way of improving your creativity. How's it affected you, Dave? Well, I mean, it's great because we have been in the studio quite a bit after the first couple months of the lockdown. I mean, we have testing twice a week and everybody's getting the sum up their nose twice a week. Yep. Not like the eighties up the nose, but uh, so yeah, a lot of, a lot of testing and, and it's in for that brief moment when you're in it and you're cutting a track, you forget all this is yeah. going on. So that's been the biggest release, but you know, it's still out there. So we're trapped in four walls, but it's a, it's a nice four walls to be trapped in, you know? Yeah. Dave, does it feel like you have more freedom now that the bean counters and the suits can't come by? And, and 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 so, so they got they got zoomed just like Pensado's place though. Yeah, yeah, but they can't zoom in. And, and 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 the reason I ask that is because it seems like it seems like um, a big a big component of what you do is preserve rawness and encourage mistakes, encourage flaws. Right. Uh, you use the example of honky tonk women by the by the Stones. It starts off at one tempo and it ends twenty five. Yeah. To, Five, those think of uh, BPMs faster at the end, and uh, the, the, the guitar is out of tune. No, no, the, the, the piano is out of tune. The guitar is, is uh, rushing, and everything you can imagine is wrong with that song. It's one of the greatest records ever, and that couldn't happen if we didn't have quarantine. You know, the bean counters would be all over you. Well, I I feel in a fortunate place. Uh, I've I've been around a lot of sessions now. Uh, People seem to let me go for a minute, and then yeah. you know, police me at the end. So, yeah. Um, yeah, good. yeah. So it took a lot of years to get to that place. So, uh, not so much bean count anymore. Yeah. No. What is it that you feel like you get from those elements? The, the mistakes, the flaws, the rawness. It, it, I know. I know. For me, I, I, my ear is drawn to drawn to those things. You know. I think. I think 
you know, country, rock and roll, blues, jazz, hip hop. I, I think my preferred way to look at it is like classical music because classical music, there is no set time. I mean, there's a conductor mm-hmm. ebbing and flowing and it's supposed to get loud and fast and quiet and slow in parts. And and I think I, yeah. I try to treat records the same way because, you know, humanity is really what I'm attracted to in music. I, I like program stuff too, but I'm just not good at it. But, which um, conductor were you emulating? With, with, with which conductor were you emulating? Probably the one you see in the virtual <laughs> screen with the two things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what I'm doing. It's, it's, it's really funny, actually. One time uh, when I was living in LA, a friend of mine called me. He was engineering a Chris Cornell record. Mm-hmm. And he called me and he said, uh, You know anybody who, who ranges horns? And I said, Yeah, I do. I never range horns in my damn life. <laughs> I lied through my teeth. He's like, well, come on down. So I go to the studio and I, and I, and I get there and uh, Steve Lillard was the producer. He's one of my heroes. And he oh, played my the gosh. track. Steve, yeah. yeah. Huge, huge hero of mine. And they play me the track and I go, okay. I'm a, and I kind of hum a little line. They're like, great, go with it. I go to a friend of mine who writes music and I sing him all the, the lines of the horns. And I hired these guys called the Texicali Horns, which are incredible players. Wow. The street music shows up. They show up. They know what they're doing. They're reading the music. I get behind like I'm conducting. <laughs> and I, I can't read music. I don't know what the hell I'm doing. But, I, but I, you know, I know the arrangement you know, in my head that we wrote. And I'm acting like I'm doing it. And Chris Cornell gets on the talk back. He's like, I love it, man. He starts whistling the line. So I got hired to arrange horns, which I've never done before. So uh, so I don't know what I'm doing, but I faked it one time as a conductor. You, know? you faked it. <laughs> One of the things that that I noticed, and I'm I'm going to step out on a limb here and give you the honorary brother award, because your relationship with vocals is exactly what happens in church. It's exactly. I grew up in church. I couldn't get away from it. I grew up Pentecostal. I was in church I, Monday, you know, Wednesday, I, Friday, Saturday, Sunday morning, Sunday night, vacation Bible study. Yeah, oh, me and you, me and you both. Mine was the Baptist side in Kentucky. Yeah, that's light. Yeah, and and my and my friends would just just bag on me because I always had to go to church every night, you know, summer camps, going to Bible school. But there's something that you learn in church about the relationship to a great voice, how to get that. And there is, I, I, as much as I love music and as much as I listen to it uh, and I managed a great singer for about 10 years, when I listen to your productions, you're I didn't know you sang. Huh? I didn't know Dave Pensado was saying. Yeah, he does. He does. We do it under a, we, he looks completely different, and we use a different name. Uh, we used to use Brian McKnight, and now we use right. <laughs> uh, But I got to tell you, man, there are moments where that relationship, and, and often when I see pictures of you recording, it's almost an intimate thing. You'll be sitting across from somebody, you're playing guitar. There's something warm and church and spiritual about how you capture a vocal, and is that does that come from church? Is that part of what you find? I think probably probably everything comes from church because I couldn't get away from it as a kid, yeah. and I, and I yeah. appreciate it because you know when you grow up in the South and you grow up in church, they just throw you up there. Yes, you, start, you sink or swim. You start yeah. to play, and I remember the first some of the first drum stuff I got. The drummer at the church gave me cymbals, you know, and, and go home and play with them. So yeah. you're always being thrown into it. But but I I think the vocal thing happens. Because I think I realized that I never liked recording as a process. I don't enjoy work. Mm. And, and I remember being a kid, you know, rehearsing with my friends in the garage. And I love that feeling when there was nobody looking, there's nobody watching. And I try to treat sessions the same way. Mm. For instance, I always like the singers going down uh, with the band because they're having fun. And the band is, is, is rocking to them. And they're getting quiet when the singer gets quiet and loud when the singer gets loud. And, uh, you know, occasionally we'll need to do a couple extra vocal takes to get words. But anytime I've actually recorded vocals after the live track, it's never the same spirit, mm. never the same thing. And it's good. It could be good. It could be better. It could be, you know, and that's there's exceptions to that rule. But something happens when the singer knows that they're not the only one going down. I think it's a very awkward concept. If I was a singer in the other room and I saw 10 people looking at me to get the vocal magic, I think I would probably be apprehensive and not be able to relax. And so yeah. getting it going down with a band is everything. I mean, yeah. all and, and also, secondly, my other secret to working <clears throat> or getting great vocals is actually working with great singers, you know, because... Helps. <laughs> Good start. That, that's all the difference. And I think I pick projects based on the singers, you know, to me, yeah. it's all about the singer. 
It really I, is. Um, I was going to ask you that because I, I went, sorry, Dave, I went through, okay. I went through low country stuff this morning and I almost didn't make this interview. I mean, I was stuck on Brandy Carlisle and I was stuck on, and I just such great singers, different spaces doing different things, whether they were rocking out or doing something intimate. And it was just, I missed that stuff in terms of what I listened to or so on and so forth. And then when you hear it, it's like having a really good wine or whatever your particular vice is and it's noticeable and it changes the way you feel, man. I, I just a shout out and appreciation to it. It's extraordinary. Oh man. I got to give all the credit to the singers, man. They make me look good. Uh, they're, they're, yeah. You, you got a little bit to do with it. Man. Hey, uh, Dave, what I was going to say was, um, um, I didn't know this, and, and now, I, now I do, so thanks for this. And when you were starting your career, in order to kind of try and do what the big guys did in the studio, you would, you would scour everything you could at the time, there was no internet, and, and look for pictures of, um, of recording studios with people recording. And I think what a wonderful way to learn how to, to mic drums, how to mic things, the gear that they were using, the combination of mics and pre's. And uh, there's a few people that still do that today. I'm sure you know, too, because a lot of times when I do an into the air, uh, I get comments about uh, uh, what, why was why was track 51 in the red? You know, so, so they're looking they're looking at us, too, today. That's good, though. But that's I, good. I encourage everybody to do that. I think that's a wonderful, wonderful technique. I, I really do. Has it helped you? Well, I think I think when I started messing around the studios, it wasn't really an apprentice yeah, apprentice environment the way it used to be. I mean, if you were at a major studio in America or England, you would have, you know, start off in the mail room and then make make coffee or tea and then you, you kind of watch people work and learn how to do what you do. And I think, you know, I started out at the era when, you know, we're still tape machines, but ADAT, so you could buy an ADAT. And so yeah. people started making records with a Mackie and ADAT. And uh, we had nobody to tell us what to do. I don't, I don't know what I was doing for years. And I didn't understand compressors for probably 10 years. Mm. I mm. had no idea. I just turned knobs because I had no idea what I was doing whatsoever. And I always like simple compressors still to this day because I still don't know what I'm doing with compressors. You know? <laughs> I'm, I'm part of that club too. <laughs> uh, when, I moved, when I moved here, I didn't know you could put something on the stereo bus. Yeah. I really did. I asked Ed C, and he goes, "Well, we just didn't do that back home." <laughs> wow, that's crazy. Yeah, I think I think the first time I messed with stereo bus compression is because the console had it in it. Yeah, yeah. 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 I, I didn't know. I I still don't know what I'm doing, man. I I'm always well, uh, figuring uh, it out. You, you, know? you do not know him pretty well. Well, yeah, yeah. The 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 Cobb not knowing concept is not not a bad thing to be taught. <laughs> well, I tell you what, I do know is hanging out with people that are smarter than me. I'm good at that. Yeah, and music too. and musicians. So you're, breaking, uh, you're breaking your tradition now with us. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> yeah, so hanging out with hanging out with good engineers, hanging out with <laughs> ministers, hanging out. Yeah, it's it's all about you know uh, being around people that inspire you. You know, I always try to do it. When you, at least with Chris, you have toured with him several times. Do you, you know, because touring is people think touring is glamorous and it can be. And certainly at that level, it's, it's done really well, but it's also, it's also work. And and it's a, you know, it's a grind when you, when you go through it, do you derive things from touring that informs your songwriting or your production, or is it just a chance to get away from the studio? What's, what's... I, I toured for a lot of years before I, before I really started producing records and I was in a sign band young and, yeah. and, quite a bit of touring the worst way in, in, a, in a minivan and oh, yeah. you know, <laughs> all sleeping on people's floors. And, and yeah. so I, I had enough of it. And that's why I started making records because I realized I could sleep in my own bed at night. And that's why I started making records. Yeah. Um, touring is something I never wanted to do. And I had no desire to do it. I enjoy playing out, but I don't like traveling. Yeah. And, um, and Chris and I have a secret bet that I can't talk about oh, and okay. I'm the bet. So I went out with them and I thoroughly enjoyed it because oh, I, you it, did. Yeah, because I mean they're my friends and 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 uh, you know we have a lot of similar interests and it was a, it was a blast to goof off and 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 get to play with people you really admire. Yeah. Um, and and I and I loved it. I loved the aspect of it. And it was really nice too because you know normally in the studio, even though you're the producer of the record, you know people walk in. What are we gonna have for lunch? What are we gonna have for dinner? 
Right. You, you guys want coffee? I mean, there's a lot of decision making, as stupid as that is. And being on tour was like, where do I go? Okay, great. I'll, I'll, exactly. That's what I'll be. And yeah. I love that. I loved being the absolute lowest guy on the totem pole and just being told what to do and where to go. And I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. You know? Point and click. Go over here. We're still yeah. Playing. Yeah. You don't have to know your way around. You know, get in a van. Yeah. You know, that's yeah. it. Get that player done. Go to the bus. Go. Yeah. Uh, and also, you know, it's also nice to tour at that level. It's a different. I mean, it was a, it was a dream. I mean, yeah. those, those were all dreams that I that I had as a kid, and I remember watching, you know, whoever it was, ACDC play these big places or whatever it was, and thinking like, man, that's just crazy. And getting to play those places is just it's surreal, you yeah. know. It was yeah. surreal. So I, I thoroughly enjoyed it, and I and I'm really just uh, beyond thankful for Chris letting me come out and play with him. Do you, do you, do you, when you're doing that or when you did it with Chris, does, does any of that, are you recording on the road? Are you doing, you know, it's, it's, it's actually, it's amazing because, uh, you know, I'm in a studio with consoles and tape machines and that year I had stuff that had to get done and I was on the road. And so I bought a laptop and I actually mixed on the plane a yeah. lot. Yeah. And, uh, and it was really great. Uh, there's one band, this band rival sons, Andrew Shep's mixed most of the records. I mixed a couple and he's mixing a laptop. And so I was like, well, if he can do it, I probably can't do it, but I'm going to try. Right. And so I mixed mine on a laptop on a plane and it was, right. it was awesome. And it was, it was so fun yeah. to kind of have, you know, people say limitations of eight track. I feel like there's great limitations of, well, we just got these plugins on the computer and some headphones. And that was, that was a lot of fun. Off we go. Yeah. yeah I enjoyed it. Exactly. Uh, and rival sons is ridiculous too, by the way. Yeah. They helped me cheat too. <laughs> speaking of uh, speaking of dialing back the equipment, are you still a proponent of uh, of what you learned by studying studios from Glenn Johns? Like uh, like all you got to do is mic the kick, snare, and overhead, and you're done on the on the drums. Uh, you know, I'd be lying to say I engineer all the time. I mean, I, I work with really talented people all the time, and and I work with different engineers per different records. Mm -hmm. uh, but what I notice is when I engineer, I will go with kick, snare, overhead because Again, it's 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 actually an education level thing, and uh, I, I just think it's it's way easier to to get those three things in phase, <laughs> and do three things and treat three things as a as one. And and I often, if I if I'm engineering, I, and even if I didn't engineer and if I mix it, I'll sum the drums down to one channel on a, on a piece of tape because it's just. Uh -huh. There's the drums. I can be creative now. I don't have to worry about. I, I don't think it really matters the perfect kick drum or the perfect snare drum mm. for, for me. I, I, and, and I'm a drummer my first drums are my first instrument, but I just think you can get caught. Uh, one, one mistake I've seen with a lot of people is they spend so much time on the drums and then eight hours later, they're ready to start pulling a vocal up. And when you get to that, it's like, don't people listen to the vocal first, you mm. know? And, and I, I, and as much as I love a great drum sound, um, I always admire people like Brendan O'Brien and Glenn Johns and these people, they just seem to pull faders up and there's your drum sound. That's it. Okay. Next yeah. thing. And I yeah. like, I like working really quick and I think it's a, it's a low attention span thing. I just like getting it rocking as fast as I can and worry about the vocal because everything else quite often um, I'll even start with the vocal and then mess with everything else later. And I think that's the way you get a vocal sound big as a house. When you yeah. started with your vocal and you got that sound and big, and start bringing up things around it. It makes the vocal sound 10 times bigger as opposed to trying to fit that vocal and that little bit of space is left between all your parallel compression and all your tricks and, and effects and stuff like that, you know? What little times I recorded was mostly in Nashville and I, and I tried to use the vocal as the guideline and I always record with the vocal either singing intentionally to be kept or singing um, uh, a, a scratch, you know? And, but I always like to have the, the singer sing with the band in his, in his headphones. Is that what you're talking about, or are you talking about more from a mix perspective right I was, now? I was just talking about from a mix perspective, honestly. I think it's, you know, like with mix, I'll literally start with a vocal a lot of times. Oh, okay. Because uh, uh, I feel like if I can get that sounding big, then the rest will kind of come together. I know that sounds like a weird way to do it. There's a lot of records um, early on that the, the mixes were just my rough, my balance the day of. Mm -hmm. And then when I try to mix them, I can't beat it because yeah. I think all of a sudden my brain is in the game. I'm trying to 
make everything bigger and better. And then I realized I've just squashed the whole thing by trying to make things bigger. Uh, and it's all education based. I'm not that smart with this stuff. So it's, it, it, it's like, I feel like my initial initial day intent is always better than when I go into mix mode, if that makes any sense. You know what I'd love to hear? I'd love to hear, I'm sure I heard too. I'd love to hear uh, your techniques purely the way you do them and want to do them combined with uh, vocals from Kane Brown, like, like mix. He's a, like, he's a great, he's a great a little bit with the country world with uh, Dave Cobb world. That'd be, that'd be, I'd love to hear that. He's, he's a, he's a great singer. As a matter of fact, I, I got to, uh, work on something it wasn't for him directly but country music hall of fame had a benefit and he sang live at it and i did a quick balance uh with a friend of mine here so yeah he's a great singer man this he got on sm7 and he sounded big as a house it wasn't any yeah. work for him. Uh, and i were talking about one day and he's the new country i mean for sure it's exciting man there's i think music in general we're we're almost back at a place uh i graduated in 1992 in 1992 uh it wasn't the sixties or the seventies, but you had all these bands. You had bands yeah. like Fishbone and Nine Inch Nails and and just this hugely eclectic Red Hot Chili Peppers, all this eclectic music and music was splintering and mm-hmm. it was all good and it was all commercial and it was all acceptable. And uh I think when X band, which I won't speak about, had their first diamond record, then alternative music became a format. And then then you know, I remember uh used to have to have a guy who did you know, noises and programming for rock bands for a while to get on the radio. Yeah. You got X, Y, and Z to have an alternative uh, hit. And I think it was that way in, in all, all genres of music. But I think, you know, when people are doing these really experimental records of every genre, they seem to be getting applauded and rewarded. And it's a really good time um, to be experimental. So not just countries grow and, and the future of countries changing, but I think everything's changing. It's a really fun time for music right now. We're we're back to we're back to breaking shit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, 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 you know, well, some of us never left. We're, we're, <laughs> well, you know, I mean that that is actually true. We 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 think about that from inside the show's perspective and so on and so forth. All these different things that you find, and you know, like we were talking to the people who produced Bad Bunny, and and literally, you know, that English was almost a second language. And I closed the show saying. You need to go discover Go-Go, try some shit there, smash it together, and see what the hell happens. And they were like, go, go, go. We have to go look. And I just said, oh, please go do it. So my, my fever dream for you is the Cobb County All-Star Choir, where you <laughs> pick, you pick uh, I'll executive produce it, where we pick a bunch of black churches around the Nashville area. You know what's funny is I, I will tell you that I'm actually making a choir gospel church record right now. Exactly. Yes. It's it's black church. It's yes. everybody singing old spirituals in a modern representation. And then I might be calling you because I want to get features on the whole thing. So yeah, oh, I'm happy to do that. I, I, I'm already there. We already made the record. We got, uh, we, we, we got get features. Good. Don't worry. Yeah. yeah. I, I literally was like, my God, that record will be. So I'm glad we're, we're tracking. That's the, I mean, that's the, that's the music that speaks to me. I always, I always say like nothing's more powerful than hearing a proper symphony orchestra or a gospel choir done right. There's, there's no, there's no, I've never experienced anything more powerful in my life. Yeah. This is I, as, as church going boys. Yeah. Uh, and my mother was just a church for that. I had no choice. I, I remember being in the eighth grade in front of the church and I would make my male friends rehearse and we did ball of confusion by the temptations. They were the backup choir. Nice. <laughs> While we recite the lyrics and those lyrics now are relevant today from yeah. way back then, but it was the power of it being in church. That's just, so I'm thrilled you're doing that record. It's yeah, really man. Awesome. Yeah, man. Keep a secret. Oh, oh absolutely. We'll talk about it. <laughs> very, very cool. It, speaking of evolving stuff, you know, one of the things that from when we started coming to Nashville to now, I mean, it feels like Nashville is growing and changing every four months. It was, you know, and it, it, does it affect the music scene in positive ways and that splintering or is it becoming so commercialized? What, what's going on? No, I think it's a fun place. I mean, it's still it's. It, I, I, I liken and maybe this is a bad analogy. But I liken uh, Nashville to the Alamo. 
It, to me, it's like the last bastion. Yes. Still afford to live, make music, have record labels, studios, infrastructure, and uh, and the art still be alive. And and so, uh, it's the perfect melting pot right now. It's incredible. <laughs> and we got we we got. It seems like every week there's somebody else coming here. Yeah. They're like, oh my god, Mike Alzando moved here. People that it, are really yeah. fire. Yeah. yeah, I didn't know that. Wow. Yeah, everybody's coming here. You know, everybody's I mean? there. I heard La- I heard Lars from Metallica lives lives here. I don't know if that's true, yeah. but wow. I think now people just make stuff up too, though. You know, to, what I mean? just to say they're in Nashville. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's- so, so I, I, I said this a million times, and I'll reiterate: um, the best musicians on the planet are in Nashville. And um, period. In a conversation, let's move on. Next question. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with you on that. Uh, well, and again, other- again, that's just because I think that it's so it's historically so affordable to live here that you can actually spend you know your ten thousand hours mastering your craft. Yeah. You know? You, you could get out, you could, you'd have, you know, two day a week job and spend the rest of the week practicing. And I, I think, I, I think uh, the economy has a lot to do with that in a great way. And I'll tell you what else I've noticed as an outsider who fell in love so heavily the first time I went and, you know, every time we get a chance to go back, it's, it, res- it respects the city and the culture respects the craft of music. Yeah. So when you come in the studio, you're expected to know how to read how to work with others, you take a dinner break. I can't do that. Not you. <laughs> that can't be a period, not yeah. just music. But that's one of those secrets we keep. Yeah. yeah. But, but there's a there's an allegiance to the craft to respect it in whatever way. And so instead of becoming a detriment in a session, you add to it, whatever you add to it, and, and you respect the spirit. I mean, you can feel that when you walk in the airport. There's so many little hundred yeah. bands playing in restaurants and stuff. And it's you know, I remember moving to Los Angeles and moving to Los Angeles from Georgia. You get there and everybody's talking about entertainment. You know, right. everywhere you go, it could be a lawyer, it could be you know, uh, a waitress publisher or whatever. And here, all they talk about is music. I mean, you could put a band together at any lunch you go to. You know, yeah. it's probably yeah. pretty killer. Yeah, no, it it is uh, it is a spectacular music city for for absolutely sure. And also the education down there, you can you can whether it's do it yourself or learn at a school or you have lots and lots and lots of choices yeah. uh, in Nashville and surrounding intensities. Just, it is, is absolutely amazing. So your plane has got to be full. You, you got exciting stuff coming besides the, the choir record. I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. No, I got a lot of stuff that I can't talk about. But, I know. You know uh, all, all <laughs> but I've been, I've been doing a lot of movie stuff the last couple of years. So I, it's, I was going to ask that. I'm really excited about that world because Watching those like Marconi films and stuff, I always love. You know, when I when I make regular records, I'm always thinking kind of cinematically. You yes. know, and and yes. so it's always been a, <clears throat> a childhood dream to do score and and do film music. And so I've been doing a lot of that, and I got a few films coming out. You know, whenever the world releases films again, yeah, um, but I'm I'm super excited about the film thing and really tying film to Nashville because we have the infrastructure here, we have the writers. We have, you know, we have the players, we have the studios. It's just a matter of time to to kind of connect dots there. So I've been really enjoying focusing on that quite a bit. Oh, that's great. Uh, Because you you were involved with The Star is Born with with Gaga and and Bradley Cooper, right? Yeah, I did did some of the stuff on that and bought bought some of my favorite songwriters out there. And they wrote a lot of, you know, about eight tracks in a a week out there. It was was really cool to see the the power of of the Nashville pen, you know? Amazing. Amazing. Gaga yeah, said something to me when the writers were there. She's like, Nashville, everybody knows Nashville has the best writers in the world. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. It, was really, it was really cool to, 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 to get to do that. Yeah. And she's gifted, man. Yeah. She's a great singer. She's yeah, great. Yeah. For sure. Um, gear side, are you, are you, you're somewhere between keeping the analog stuff? Or are you, are you doing big, crazy plugins and, uh, I like it all. Uh, you know, I like it all. I, I love, there's so much good new gear being made. And I think that's probably the thing I'm most excited about. You know, yeah. Yeah. Uh, my buddy Wade at Chandler is just making incredible new stuff. You know, I always loved Beatle records and he makes most of the stuff that they, they use or new, new, new renditions of it. And that's really exciting that you can go and buy a brand new piece of gear. That's amazing. Spectrasonics is another console company that's making incredible stuff, you know, and, mm-hmm. and still Neve makes great stuff. There's, there's so much 
incredible new gear and i'm really excited about that you know universal yeah. audio you can go buy a brand new 1176 that's an la2a you know and so that's that's all exciting to me yeah yeah uh, a lost art um and all of this is matching um preamps with microphones do you have any suggestions on because i get that question a lot i don't think people understand impedance anymore yeah, that is funny you say that, but that's, that's a real that's a real thing, man. There, there is there is a when we have time, we do dork out sessions, and I, I I feel very fortunate to to have people that are way smarter than I am with this stuff, and they've done their sessions, and we get here and we'll listen to every microphone in the place, and it be it's surprising what wins, you know. It's not yeah. always the most desirable vintage mic that wins, you know. Yeah. Don't uh, and, as yeah. a footnote, don't go to, don't, don't go do that at Blackbird because you'll still be <laughs> <laughs> you still be in there. Yeah, you still you'll be, be there. at the console. Too. That's that's absolutely true. Yeah, uh, sorry to interrupt. That's a real thing, man. That is a real thing. Matching, you know what I've noticed? Some of the U eighty sevens and things like that match really great with seventies gear. You change the formula on that; it's pretty cool. But the seventies stuff is perfect. A Coles and a ribbon mic matches a great tube pre because of the impedance thing you're talking about. It's the perfect match for the that dynamics work really great with old preamps that the impedance is they, they were made for an era when people used ribbons and dynamics. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we spent a lot of time. And not only not only just that, you know, I love an SM7. I, I think SM7 is, yeah. is probably the first vocal mic I put up because it mm -hmm. seems to work on everybody. And, and that is really important, you know, to, to, you know, we use cloud lifters and things like that to kind of boost the signal, but finding the perfect match for that is a big thing. And then you find an SM7, then you go, well, I got four SM7s. Let's listen to every one of them. I rate them. And now my mics say like high, mid, bass. Yeah. So I know depending on the singer, uh, if they got a real bright voice, I'll go for the low one. I'll just put it up real quick and I don't have to try anything on them. So, Have you ever tried putting one in the freezer to get more brightness? <laughs> right. They used to freeze plates, didn't they, too? <laughs> Play reverbs. Yeah, no, I, I will try that now. Thanks, Dave. Okay. You just hit me on a dork day. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I spent a lot of time like listening to mics and really, really listening to preamps. And you know, old console is a perfect example of number 17 is seems to be the magic vocal one mm -hmm. number three is the best kick drum one and 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 i know that sounds really dorky but you spend time doing that when the client shows up you're not doing that you just have it plugged in right and things you can get sounds in 10 minutes so we spent yeah. a lot of time yeah. listening trying to match things for impedance uh it's 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 a that's that's a that's a game i i haven't totally figured it all out i'm still figuring all that out well you were doing something useful i was trying to convince my new assistant that one hard drive sounds better than the other. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, you probably remember when CDRs first came in the studio, like people used to buy different CDRs because of the sound. And that was a real thing. Yeah. That was a real yeah. thing. Um, so yeah, there actually is a thing with, and I'm not going to name the service, but there is a thing with certain uh, storage archival services that sound different. You know? yes, yes, there is. <laughs> yes, there is. Which is interesting. I had that happen on session uh, recently, where we sent the mixes via one of these one of these services, and they kept going. Man, it just doesn't sound right. It doesn't sound like the 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 the, the you know the, the little thumb drive. <laughs> and it was because that service, that top end service, has a compression to it. Yeah. And it's crazy. I know, and I didn't believe it. And they were right. I mean, they had better ears than I do, and they showed me. Wow. And it's true. So yeah, there. So it never ends, Dave. Basically, it does you know? All right, Dave P. It's time for you to uh, trot out Batter's Box. We. Uh, I, I started rather arrogant on this uh, on this episode here, but I think I'd prefer not to. Uh, prefer not to do arrogance. That's impossible. Let's go arrogance. <laughs> okay. Okay. Here we go. <laughs> Uh oh, that's a David Letterman thing. I'm, I'm studying Bruh. different. different Did he lick it? Did he lick the? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Here we go. Uh, console. That I, you know, I one would word, say one word, Dave. One word. One word. One word. Uh, I Neve. Yeah, I'll go Neve. <laughs> yeah, that was kind of rude on my part. Yeah. Um, got to got to do what you got to do. You know, trash talking in sports. Overall, um, it's overall, you know, it's a overall, but I like so many different consoles. As a matter of fact, I'd hoard consoles if I could, you know. <laughs> okay. Uh, reverb. 
Uh, EMT one forty. Compression. Eleven seventy six. Drums. Ludwig's old ones. Wow. Ah. Favorite vocal mic. SM seven. Major or minor. What does that mean? <laughs> okay, I don't want to say the words that are coming out of your mouth. Okay, okay. Being, a, being a true, a true, incredible uh, broadcaster, I will continue on. All right. Um, perfection. I hate it. I hate it. Stereo bass. That mono. Synthesizers. Uh, because I'm done with the stuff, I'm going to go Juno 106, but I don't know anything about synthesizer. Ooh, cool. I know nothing that's about it. That's good. That's good. You can fake me out on that one. Uh, Beatles. Revolver. Uh, ADT. Automatic double tracker, huh? You're going mm-hmm. to the Beatles train. You did go highbrow. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I... I I I I cheat and do it all the time with with two tape recorders and probably do it totally wrong. But uh, I yeah, do like that was the last question. Intensely explain to our audience how the automatic double tracker came about with John Lennon and and everything. Well, you probably know better than I. But basically, the, a lot of those early records they were yeah. double vocals, and the Beatles didn't feel like they wanted to spend the time doing it, so they developed the technology that doubles vocals automatically by taking two tape machines and warbling one of them slowly. So it kind of goes down and goes up and they blend it together and it sounds like a double track. That's yeah. probably the simplest non-educated way to say that. Yeah, that's pretty yeah. cool. Isn't it? Yeah. All right. This uh, is the part where Herb says that, that you, you clean my clock. So I'm ready again. Well, I mean, look, at you have to take the additive factors. These guys from, you know, Savannah, Southern, grew up in church. But you know, my last name is Cobb too, right? Like baseball uh, player. Yeah. Uh, 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 so, you know, you, you weren't supposed to win this. It's just what, uh, and, and because he's so organic, like he just didn't have a chance, but you did good, Dave Pintado. You did. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's pretty high, Brad, though. ADT. Is that the first time you asked somebody ADT? Because that's, yes. that's a strong question. A strong question. A strong uh, answer. It, it was impressive. It, it was impressive. You know um, what? A lot like you, um, I, 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 I plan really well for all of this. And then, that, and then when I get, Get in the moment. I, I don't know what I'm doing. So yeah. <laughs> so we no, like every day in the studio. In arms because neither one of us know what the hell we're doing. And this is a fantastic lesson for the audience. You don't have to know shit. And, you know, you do well. <laughs> and it's it's funny though when I get in a session, man. I, I don't really prepare for them because mm-hmm. I think I, I I think there's there's a certain advantage to being put on the spot and trying to swim. And yeah. I, I like that. And I like right. that sound of that on records too so so uh, cheating is a good thing you know yeah no, I, I feel the same way we do the show i, I recently co-hosted nam's thing and they i was called in kind of as a relief guy because they didn't want the guy to carry it by himself and i said just let me get there yeah roll Let, let's just yeah. let, let, it, let it be yeah, you got a gift man you got the gift of gab you got well, it. And, but it's having stuff thrown at you and people in your ears and you just kind of create on the spot you know yeah um, switching gears really quickly because you had the advantage of working with him. Um, and ironically, he passed on my birthday, John Prine. Um, yeah. What a, t- I got, I got, this is a strong language and I'm probably from my church days shouldn't say it, but fuck COVID. Yes. I mean, yes. seriously, it took a good man who as strong as an ox. Yep. Who seemed to overcome every single uh, health thing you could imagine and always come on top and, 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 and never be, never, never spend a day in his life that I saw him without a smile on and that yeah. thing took him down. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, man, he was, he was magic is it's, and, and it's yeah. too far away, but in the studio, I still have a Christmas tree up because John Prine has a Christmas tree with him all the time. Oh, really? He, goes, he has one up everywhere he goes. Wow. Um, and he decorates it himself. As a matter of fact, the one, the one I got here has, some custom color vinyl that he hung on the tree and some ornaments, but he made a, a silver ornament with Miley Cyrus on cut out on top of it, like a wrecking ball. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, he, and um, the moment we got done with the record, he, he calls me and uh, he's like, you're going to be at your house. And I was like, yeah, I'll be there. And he goes, <laughs> hangs up. 30 minutes later, another one of these white plastic Christmas trees shows up at my house with ornaments on it. So we keep That's it up right. at my house That's all right. year round all the time. And, and, 
the world's going to miss that guy, not only his talent, but his humanity and his, his laughter and his smile and his personality. I'll tell one more John Prine story just because please, you know, I, miss, I miss him a lot. This, if I had to sum up John Prine in one phrase and who he was. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Hello this, in there. Yeah, well, yeah, that song. Yeah, that's probably my favorite John Prine song. It, yeah, me too. It, um, but he said something to me. He was going on a fishing trip and he looked at me. He's like, you fish? And I was like, yeah, I fished every day growing up in Savannah, but you know, I haven't fished in 20 years. Mm-hmm. And he said, he's like, uh, and I, he's like, why don't you fish anymore? He's like, cause I don't like to get up early. I don't want to go wake up early to go fish. He's like, you think fish wear watches? <laughs> that's John Pride. <laughs> that's a, that's a window into his thought process. And I thought, man, I never thought about that. That's the smartest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> that is, that is so 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 perfect um before dave takes us home just what i want the audience to really know is that if you're blessed with success um you want to evolve as a human being too you're 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 listening to literally one of the best in history and what you're listening to is a really good guy and who's talking about what he knows what he doesn't know and that's why people go to him that honesty and that authenticity shows in his music, shows in his personality and, and why people. So he's treated us like gold from day one, no matter what's happening. He's up for a Grammy of the year. He's won every award. But when we hang together, we're just hanging with Dave Cobb. And it is a wonderful thing, brother. Much respect. You know, oh, man. Love- thank you all so much. Next time I see you, hopefully uh, we can actually socialize. You know. Yeah, absolutely. Shout out to Andrew Brightman, who always takes care of business. And Dave Pensado, take us home. One of the things I was getting from from, from this conversation was um, the wonderful process of music in America. Um, From time to time, a a city or a town or uh, an area will come along and just elevate music to a high level. When I was a kid, it was Muscle Shoals. Then later on, it was Memphis with American Sound. And then there was the Philly Sound. And then there was uh, the Wrecking Crew in L.A. There was... uh, um, bounce music in, in New Orleans and jazz in New Orleans and and what a wonderful country we live in and and much respect to, to the people that started those movements and um, they need to be rewarded for what they did uh, sadly I'm, I'm in the show on a sad note um, uh, they've been mined for all their good ideas but they've never received any compensation for it and most of these people died very very poor but on a positive note some of the greatest music ever uh, Dave I, I know you're into all of that also and, and um, what a wonderful country that can give us the freedom to create that type of music and we should respect it more I forgot uh, Nashville by the way yeah, yeah, probably so. That's a good time. It's a good time to be alive. There's a lot of great music being made. So, and, and it's and it is, you know, from the the past influencing all of us. So you're right. We need to do need to be thankful for all the people that figured out how to plug a mic in before we got to it. You know.